So one thing we'd like to do is to call out what's coming. When we start investigating digital components uh, for this module, we're going to be working with uh, virtual systems. And when you engage the 4.1 assignment, it's going to smell and feel and look like, oh, I've been down this road before. It's um, it's what you're you're performing the same steps that you did early in the semester to prepare or optimize your personal technology. And it's just a good thing to do every month or so, especially if you're going to be creating virtual systems. And so what we'd like to do is just give you a heads up. I haven't posted it yet, but I will afterwards. Then we're going to ask you to do some things to build virtual replicas of digital components, system components. And um, in order to do that kind of thing, you, your personal technology needs to be uh, up to speed. Every few weeks, there are serious updates. If they don't post, then things get slow or they don't work properly. So it's just a good habit to be in. And I thought I'd explain what's going on there. It, it'll it'll feel like deja vu, but it's important for you to do that if things are going to work right for the 4.2 assignment and then for the creation of a virtual system. You may not have a lot of hard disk space, but the VM, the virtual machine we're going to build out of digital components is going to use a version of Linux that's very kind to uh, hard disks. So it's going to take up a very small footprint and uh, it'll be a version of Linux where it, it works and operates um, like any other computing system. But each of the digital components that are used to build that machine are going to be uh, created in the virtual box environment. We'll also be working out a device manager. So that's what we're doing here. We want to explain what's going on with the operating system and how the operating system itself creates uh, virtual components based on the actual physical components and how it uses RAM to do that. So once again, all of that hinges on the serviceability of your own personal technology. Now, if you find that you don't have hard disk space or your personal technology is compromised, um, we can provide you with a hardware host where you can build your own online, but it requires additional uh, measures in order to be able to access from your smartphone or from your PC. So I just wanted to mention that before we get into this. Um, please contact me immediately if you run into problems with the two assignments and the solution in this, in this module. So what we'd like to do is uh, go ahead and continue to finish our review of physical materials and how digital components are built and then pivot to get into things like the digital flip-flop and the memory register and so on. We did mention on the periodic chart that copper, aluminum, silver, and gold, uh, back in the day, silver was actually used, gold is still used. It's, it's, um, it's embedded over uh, conductors in very thin layers. So gold is, gold is unique among metals in that it can, it can be made so thin that it's um, just a few atoms thick, but it still helps improve the conductivity of electronic components. For this reason, uh, there's a lot of older there's a lot of older um, digital and transistor uh, appliances that are melted down so that the gold can be extracted. And there's actually YouTube videos on how to extract gold from old CPU chips. The pins on the CPU chips are coated with gold. You have to do a lot of work and there's a lot of toxic substances to get a very little bit of gold. So um, if any of you were thinking of starting uh, starting a business, uh, I actually had a family member that thought they'd try to do that. 
but it didn't work. Um, does everybody see this right here? Yeah. So beach sand is actually, there's different kinds of beach sand, right? Did you know there are some beaches that have sand and it's not actually silica, it's, it's something else. It's like seashells, uh, crushed seashells. Has anyone ever been on a, a beach where the sand is actually very small pieces of shells? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when we talk about beach sand generically, we're not talking about beaches where the sand is uh, composed of crushed shells. We're talking about the mineral and there are mines, silica mines. So inland, there are places where there's a lot of sand. It's, uh, it's a part of the uh, mineral resources and that sand is basically uh, silicon dioxide and, and, and other minerals. And that's what silica is composed of. This video is actually really worth watching. And I'm, I'm just gonna click these links to make sure that this version of the, of the um, study guide is, is still intact, but you, you really need to, whenever you see a link, you should Did take you know the time. You can generate an endless supply of power simply from the ground beneath you. Do not buy solar panel. And did you know this guy's a huckster and what he's pitching is fraudulent? Kind of. Yeah. So he was talking about this um, machine, a perpetual motion machine, and how it's going to get electricity out of the ground and it's it's fraudulent so i just nothing come just remember nothing comes from nothing right okay so this is still good still shows how this works they take the silica they turn it into molten and they create a crystal with it and these are the wafers and the wafers are etched. So when the wafers are etched, they're adding materials. So this is done in stages or phases where the lasers are creating pockets or re receptacles, miniature receptacles, very microscopic receptacles. And then there are baths or uh, solutions of compounds that are applied in, in layer fashion. And that's how you get the alternating materials uh, deposited in the, in the stuff. It's, it's actually really, uh, really cool graphics. And it, it, does, it does a fair job of showing how um, that material is modified physically and then and then there are other substances that are deposited to create the traces. When we say trace, we're saying wire. So it's the same kind of thing, wire. Um, when you have a trace on a circuit board, it's basically a flat wire. I just thought we'd call that out. Uh, please take the time to watch this from start to finish. It's really worth... Um, watching and there are going to be questions in the assessment based on all the videos so you actually do need to watch each of the videos i just thought we would make sure everybody understood that um let me see if there's something here from last four years i am making hundreds of electronics projects hello PCB stands for printed circuit board. Was there a question? Um, did you start recording? Say again. Did you start recording? Uh, I did. Okay. Yep. Uh, it's recording. And uh, so I'm not going to play this as well, but PCB stands for printed circuit board. 
And so it's showing you how circuit boards are built. The circuit boards are combinations of insulating materials and conducting materials. So once again, the word trace comes into effect, right? So we're talking about the traces and then- Being so nice to women. I'm not sure why that ad is playing, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. So moving right along, you're gonna have different ads based on, um, yeah. So DFF, let's keep going. Other metals. So each of these links, gallium. In the interest of time, if you discover a link isn't working and you're the first to email me, uh, we'll log additional credit for you. But the rest of the link should be good. We did talk about germanium and arsenic, right? And arsenic is actually used in rat poison, but in combination with germanium, it becomes a semiconductor that's useful for building certain kinds of uh, CPUs. Did anyone, has everyone seen the movie Terminator? Yeah. So mm -hmm. some of the uh, technology advances that the movie portrays, they're cubic, um, cubic digital components. Those are based on uh, actual designs for like cubic builds of digital components instead of flat chips, it's cubic in nature for memory. And, and there has been a good bit of work for uh, germanium and for gallium arsenide. And uh, that's something that um, we wanna keep coming back to because even though silicon uh, silica is used for the the wafers and the dye um, that are etched to create the CPUs and memory uh, chips. It's we're on the edge of uh, more breakthroughs. So the material science is is moving much faster, uh, much much faster than than the software in in the industry. So we've mentioned before that NANs are used and NORs are used to build uh, digital components uh, generically. And this is just a refresher, but the MUX and uh, D multiplexer are two components that allow for communications, digital communications. So when you're able to switch, you're able to channel uh, the flow of ones and zeros and that's a critical there's a critical dependency when it comes to communications on that function so that's just something that we want to make sure everybody's aware of if if you weren't already aware of that so we wouldn't have networking and telecommunications without multiplexers and demultiplexers now we touched on sequence and time. And one of the things that is critically important, another dependency in computing is the ability to handle things in a given sequence of tasks. And that means that you have to have an order so that things that are designated to compute first uh, actually are, op you know, the operations are completed first before the next steps are. So sequence and time components are a tipping point without those functions, without the capacity to work sequence and time in digital components, you, you really don't have what you need to build a computer. So you can have communications with multiplexers and demultiplexers, but there's still like a missing link. And this is one of the most important innovations because if you couldn't handle instructions in an orderly fashion and you couldn't work uh, timing, everything would just kind of happen all at once. And, that, and that's, that's an oversimplification, but essentially um, you can't 
you can't overstate the importance of the flip-flop. So there's another link here that uh, provides additional information about the flip-flop. But if you've heard the term event or, or clock, system clocks, how many of you knew that your computers have a built-in clock that requires a battery? Yeah, yeah, I know about it. CMOS battery, right? Yeah, there's a... It is, it looks like a watch battery. So if you look on most motherboards, there's there's a small button cell, the same kind of battery that goes in clocks, in watches, uh, or hearing aids, you know, these, these uh, round batteries. And what it's doing is, is it's providing power for the system memory, the CMOS, right? So motherboards have a protocol that they execute every time they're powered on. And in order for that to work properly, there has to be a system date and time that's stored. The actual memory for the startup protocol does not require a battery. Let me repeat that. The actual protocols to start up a computer when it's powered on in the BIOS, right? The, the, that's um, embedded in persistent memory, a special kind of memory chip. And it's, it's called an EEPROM or a PROM. That doesn't require a battery, but in order for the system startup to work properly, the battery cell is actually needed to preserve the date and the time so that when you start it up, uh, your computer knows, okay, today is the 25th of October and the time is. When you turn on your computer, if you see it's January 1st, midnight, January 1st of like 2001 or January 1st of 1999, if you power on the screen and you see that the time, the system time is always January 1st, January 1st, it just needs a battery replaced. And all you have to do is take this to Home Depot or your favorite electronics store or Plaza East, you know, where they have these, uh, Gallows Bay Hardware. I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of places on St. Thomas also, but there's a, a certain model number here it's usually cr 2023 or cr 2025 you buy the same thing you pop it in there and then you're fine sometimes systems will malfunction so profoundly people think oh it, i have to replace my computer because the date and the time are broken right and that's not the case it just needs a battery any questions about this Can someone unmute your mic and let me know we're still still there? Yeah, we're okay. It's just still here. So a flip-flop is ingenious. And I know this is going to be an oversimplification of what's going on here, but you'll notice the crisscross here. And and yes, there's more detail in this link, and uh, we need you to go ahead and look at that, but Essentially, the ones and zeros are traveling. So you have conductors with ones and zeros. And, and there's a, a set and a reset here. So as this thing cycles around, the flip-flop, the crisscross of this flip-flop essentially allows for um, a loop to play out, kind of like the seconds on a clock that are ticking. It's a pulse, right? And so as the thing keeps running in a cycle over and over again, that repetitive cycle, that cycle becomes the basis for timing. The cycle becomes the basis for timing. And it's that timing that's used so many, so many cycles per second. So if it's 60 cycles per second, that's called 60 hertz. Hertz is the unit of measure for a cycle. 
And if there are 60 of those in each second, and your system is cranking out 60 of those because it's 60 hertz, your computer goes, okay, there's 60 cycles in a second. I've just had 60 cycles, which means a second has passed, right? That allows the controller of the CPU to do its magic. Now, in terms of sheer logic, when that cycle runs, the ones and zeros are looped. And here you see that uh, what comes out is the same thing that comes in, right? So with each cycle, the stuff that goes into this um, logic gate is what comes out. And that would seem like it's no big deal. Uh, wait a minute, let me see if I get this right. I'm putting ones and zeros into this thing. And what I get out a cycle later is the same thing. Why don't I just have a straight wire? It's the cycle, it's the loop that's important. It's the basis for timing, okay? And that's something we need you to think about, reflect on, and take on faith for now. A cycle is a source of oscillation. So when you have a cycle, there are other ways to represent this thing. In electricity, when you have electrical flow, there are two kinds of electricity. Does anyone know in terms of the flow of electricity, what two types of electricity we use? Or let's say current. There's two types of electric current. Does anyone know what the two types of electric current are? And that DC and AC? It's DC and AC, that's correct. So DC is direct current, that's what you get from a battery and there's no oscillation, right? But our, our power system uses a generator that alternates with magnets and wires and that creates a wave, right? And that's alternating current. So electrons are pushed by those waves down the wire. That's an oversimplification, but again, just take that on faith. AC current alternates, DC current does not. Sometimes you switch from DC to AC. This is really important to understand. Our electrical oscillations out of the outlet are not what we want in a computer. What we want to do is convert that to DC and then use a flip-flop so that the oscillation occurs a million times a second. This is called a megahertz. Has anyone ever heard of the term megahertz? Yeah. Or gigahertz, right? We talk about gigahertz. So if you look at a computer system and we go into, well, let's do it this way. So everybody sees the 2.5 GHZ, that's gigahertz. So megahertz is a million hertz, what's giga? If mega is a million, what's giga? A billion. A billion, yes, that's correct, thank you. A billion. So it's 2.5 roughly, 2.5 billion cycles. So that's a whole lot more than 60, right? When we're looking at at uh, WAPA power, WAPA power is either 60 hertz or 50 hertz. Uh, in most countries, it's 50 or 60 hertz. And it varies depending on the voltage and the, the way that the electrical is, is generated. But um, that alternating current is converted with a transformer into direct current, like the battery current. And then it's the system clock, right? Now it used to be that they they would they would use an actual crystal. So so there would be a mineral, a rock, a crystal uh, that was used. And when you passed electricity through it, the crystal would vibrate or oscillate, 
at thousands of times a second or millions of times a second. And then uh, computer, engine computer engineers uh, devised a way to do this much faster using uh, semiconductors. So a flip-flop, they had, it took them a while to figure this out, but basically the flip-flop allows the in and the out. And then as you take that flip-flop and noodle with this, can everybody see, can everybody see, whoops, this image right here. You can. So a digital flip-flop, the symbol for the digital flip-flop is a rectangle with a triangular offset. Well, by offset, we mean there's a chink. There's a, a chunk of the side of this bottom rectangle that's missing. And it's in the shape of a triangle, right? So there's an there's a piece that's missing here, like a dent in the bottom corner. We call that an offset. So so there is a triangular shape chunk missing from the bottom border of the rectangle that we use to represent a DFF. If you don't see the letters DFF, but you see a rectangle with that chunk missing, that's what it's talking about. It is talking about a digital flip-flop, but the digital flip-flop and the MUX combined are how memory registers work. So if you take a one-bit memory register, this is the first memory component. When we're talking about RAM, when we talk about random access memory or memory chips, non-volatile, volatile memory, not we're not talking about disk memory, which is non-volatile. We're talking about memory that is active only when the power is on. When the power is on and the electric is flowing, this MUX and the DFF are combined. And essentially what happens is that if you, if you put a one into this memory register with each clock cycle, the one is refreshed. Repite usted, por favor refreshed go ahead unmute your microphone humor me a bit i need everybody to unmute your microphone one at a time and say the word refreshed refresh refreshed yeah thank you refreshed refreshed come on everyone one at a time refreshed Yes, I'm deep Refresh. processing. Yes, I'm, be, I'm we're deep we're deep processing. We're making you respond and repeat that word refresh. It's the refresh cycle. Uh when you has anyone ever heard of overclocking? Yeah. You overclock a processor or you overclock the RAM? What what, you, what you're doing is is you're forcing the refresh cycle to to happen faster than the chip is designed to accommodate. That's what you're doing. So it's the refresh cycle. When with each refresh cycle, the original input is refreshed or reloaded so that if, if you put a one in there or you put a zero in there, it's gonna remain a one or it's gonna remain a zero with each clock cycle as the memory uh, function is refreshed. And, and that happens with each, uh, each cycle, right? And the important thing to understand is that as long as the electricity is flowing, that works. Now, when you remove the electricity, that's when this disappears, okay? So as you remove the active electric current in your computer, if it isn't stored on the hard drive with uh, magnetic ones and zeros, you'll lose it, okay? Or if it isn't stored on a CD or DVD because the laser burns ones and zeros on the media. It's lost forever. But as long as the electric is flowing, this thing keeps going and going and going. It's really fascinating stuff and it's ingenious. It's It literally changed all of the 
the outcomes for electronic and electrical engineers because they discovered a way to create a physical digital component that can store ones and zeros and retain the same value every time it's refreshed, right? And, and that's huge because without the ability to store temporarily data and instructions, you don't have a computer. So RAM, random access memory, we randomly store ones and zeros in one bit registers. If we have eight of those together, that's called a byte. So we have talked about bytes already, haven't we? A byte is how many bits in a byte? Eight bits. Eight bits, that's right. And if you have half a byte, what's that called? A nibble. A nibble, right. Half of a byte is a nibble. Okay, good, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I do want you to memorize, and this is really important. It is important for you to memorize the logical expression that represents a flip-flop and represents a memory register. Now, this logical statement represents the flip-flop. So there's a time interval, and what's fed in the previous second is what comes out when that second presents. So the second before something is fed in and it's assigned to the output variable, right? And that's what pops out. This is a digital flip-flop logic statement. I want you to notice the difference. This is a memory, so this is the digital flip-flop and this is the memory register and this is how the logic changes. So what comes out of that logic gate? The next second is what came out of the logic gate the second before or the time interval before. It's not necessarily a second, T is not T is not a one second interval. T is more like uh, a millionth of a second or a billionth of a second. Does everybody understand what I'm saying here? Kind of. Kind of. I'll take it. We're getting there. So let's repeat this. What came out the second before is what comes out the next second. That's what a memory register is in terms of logical function. So whatever came out before is looped around with the refresh and that's what comes out with the next cycle. The output is refreshed. That's how a memory register differs from a DFF. Okay, a DFF is about input versus output the memory register is ingenious because it allows you to refresh the same output. So you feed something into a memory register and then what comes out, what comes out, what comes out, what comes out is the same thing all the time. Now, in RAM, let's talk about random access memory. And then we'll stop. Random access memory is made out of register multiples register multiples is what's used to build random access memory modules. And random access means you can feed a one or a zero randomly in there and it'll retain whatever you feed in randomly, okay? Um, more precisely, random access, when you have these registers created in multiples, you can store different binary values uh, at different memory address locations. Uh, the memory address location where things are stored is flexible. So the address of the register multiples or memory module, the memory addresses are flexible 
and the digital information can be stored randomly. That's important because you have to be able to store data and instructions. There's a data input, there's an address input, and a load bit. So the load bit makes sure that the refresh cycle is running. There's an original data input and there's an address input. So essentially we store a value, the address for that is randomly assigned. That way we can make use of our memory in a flexible manner. So the idea of random, that's an important concept. And what we want you to understand is that random refers to the capacity to store different values and it refers to the location of where that value is stored, it's flexible. So it can be stored at random addresses. It's probably easier to just think in terms of the, the addresses. When you have flexible memory, it means you can store instructions and data. And as the calculations are performed, you're gonna need to put those out, those results in different places. So you need flexible memory. You need to be able to store in different places the, the intermediate calculations when you're doing programming statements. That's where we'll stop today. We'll repeat that concept when we begin on Friday. What I'd like you to do is for everyone to bring your computer systems to class on Friday. If you can, be there physically. We're going to do some things with your personal technology, and we would like you to be able to participate. So be sure that you uh, come to class in person physically, and we want you to bring your personal technology, and we'll be doing things with digital components on Friday. But we'll start by talking about the address space that's used for memory, random access memory and why that random is such a big deal, okay? So it's, it's the flexibility that allows the computer to control how and where things are stored as needed. It's, uh, if it was very rigid and it was, um, well, original computer designs weren't as flexible and weren't as efficient. So let's just stop right there. Any questions before we, any comments, observations, or questions before we clear for the day?